Good morning. I'm Daryl West, Vice President of Governance Studies and Director of the Center for Technology Innovation at the Brookings Institution. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this forum on new ideas to advance STEM education. Science, technology, engineering, and math are crucial for America's future. Much of our past prosperity has uh, rested on innovation and creativity in the STEM fields. It's hard to imagine our economy or our national uh, security without science and technology. Yet despite the importance of this area, we have a crisis. We have insufficient numbers of American-born students getting advanced degrees in these subjects, and we need to improve the teacher training and professional development in science, technology, engineering, and math. It's important to transform STEM teaching in order to prepare students for the future economy. Research has shown that teachers are the primary factor in student growth and student achievement. Many students are disinterested in science or math because, stu because teachers are not well-trained or aren't able to convey the excitement of scientific discovery to young people. President Obama has called for putting education at the center of our national agenda. He's emphasized the need for quality teachers, investment in STEM education, and restructuring federal education funding. He's called for the addition of 100,000 new STEM teachers, identifying effective uh, teachers, and creating reward systems in order to retain top performing individuals. The president also has proposed school renovations that would build and renovate science labs in an effort to boost STEM education. To help us understand the nature of the STEM problem and possible remedies, we have brought together a distinguished set of speakers. Dr. Rebecca Blank is Acting Secretary of Commerce. Uh, previously, she was the Acting De uh, Deputy Secretary of Commerce from November uh, 2010 through July of this year. In that role, she focused on management and policy for the department's 12 bureaus and functioned as the uh, Commerce uh, Department's Chief Operating Officer. Starting in June 2009, she worked as Undersecretary for Economic Affairs and Head of the Economics and Statistics Administration uh, within uh, that department. She's played an important role in overseeing the decennial census operations that has completed its work on time and under budget, not always the case in Washington, D.C., uh, saving $1.6 billion in uh, the process. We are especially pleased to welcome her back be because before moving to uh, Commerce, she was the Robert S. Kerr Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution. So it's nice to welcome her back to her home uh, place. I met her shortly after I arrived here in uh, 2008 and was immediately impressed with her knowledge of a wide range of social and economic uh, topics. She's smart, articulate, and knows how to get things uh, done. And that certainly has uh, propelled her in her Department of Commerce uh, career. So it's terrific to have her back. We're also pleased to have other distinguished speakers. Uh, Jim Simons is president of Euclidean Capital and board chairman of Renaissance Technologies. Dr. Simons is a distinguished mathematician who has taught on the faculties of MIT, Harvard, and the State University of New York at Stony Brook. In 1976, he won the American Mathematical Society's Oswald uh, uh, Veblen Prize in uh, Geometry for work on multidimensional surfaces. He is famous for the discovery and application of certain geometric measurements that are used in theoretical physics and string uh, theory. He left academia to launch Renaissance Technologies, a hedge fund that uh, trades in commodities and financial instruments. His firm uses computer-based mathematical models to predict price changes in financial instruments, looking for non-random movements in order to make uh, predictions. He's been active in a number of different causes, but one in particular uh, that he founded is Math for America. That is a nonprofit uh, organization with the mission of significantly improving math education and teaching in uh, public uh, schools. And it does tremendous uh, work in supporting math education all across uh, the country. Dr. Charles Vest is president of the National Academy of Engineering. He's also president emeritus and professor of mechanical engineering at MIT. He's the author of two books on higher education and research policy. He has served on a variety of presidential panels, commissions, and advisory committees dealing with science and technology and is one of our nation's leading authority in those areas. 
Charles Giancarlo is Managing Director and Head of Value Creation for Silver Lake Partners, a leading private equity firm specializing in technology and communications. He has over 25 years of experience in the technology field. He served as Executive Vice President and Chief Development Officer at Cisco. He is responsible for Cisco's expansion into new technologies and new markets. And so he will bring a private sector uh, perspective to uh, this uh, discussion. Our format today will be as follows. We will start with an address by Secretary Blank. Uh, the Department of Commerce uh, has uh, put out several reports uh, recently they put out a report a couple weeks ago uh, entitled Women in STEM, a Gender Gap uh, in Innovation. And this morning, uh, the department is putting out another report, uh, Education Supports uh, Racial and Ethnic Equality in uh, STEM. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Rebecca Blank back to Brookings. Just like magic, the slideshow pops up. Thank you very much, Daryl. It is an absolute delight to be here. It's always good to be back at Brookings and um, see all my old friends. And it's a particular honor to be um, with this group um, who are far more distinguished than I and have far more on the ground experience with actually trying to recruit people into STEM related fields. Um, so as you all know, I mean, so why are we talking about this topic today? A um, globally competitive economy requires a skilled and a globally competitive workforce. Making sure that we have workers trained in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, the so-called STEM fields, is absolutely critical. Over the past 10 years, growth in STEM jobs was three times as fast as growth in non-STEM jobs. STEM workers play a key role in the sustained growth and stability of the U.S. economy and are particularly important in sectors where U.S. universities and businesses are on the cutting edge of innovation and new product development. Those are the economic facts, but there's an important human element to these statistics as well. If STEM jobs are more stable and STEM workers earn higher wages and are less likely to become unemployed, then producing more STEM graduates and workers means having more Americans in well-paying, high-growth jobs that can support healthy communities. So there are competitive and social incentives for the U.S. to encourage more students to enter science, technology, engineering, and mathematics fields. Now, over the past several months, the Economics and Statistics Administration inside the Department of Commerce, which is uh, my, my, my old job there, um, has released two reports on the STEM workforce. The first report discuss the STEM workforce in general and the trends in STEM jobs over time. The second report focused on the gender gap in STEM training and jobs. And today, we are releasing the third report in this series, which looks at diversity of STEM workers in the United States, focusing on differences in racial and ethnic backgrounds, as well as on the role of foreign barn workers in STEM fields. And I want to introduce Mark Domes, um, who is the chief economist at the Department of Commerce, who's actually done much of this work. So Mark, raise your hand. He's, he's the one to talk to if you actually want to say, where did these numbers really come from? Um, I want to summarize some of the most important conclusions from these reports and then talk briefly about some of the initiatives the administration is doing that Daryl has already mentioned that are really designed to encourage more students and particularly women and students of color to enter STEM training. So um, let's start by talking about you know, the first question, what's the definition, right? Good academic question here. Um, how do we define STEM jobs? And there's two types of things one needs to define. You need to define STEM jobs and you need to define fields of study, because we're going to be interested both in, you know, how many people are in STEM training as well as how many people are in STEM jobs. So um, we are using um, definitions that are actually provided by the National Science Foundation. There's a small variations on what we're doing relative to what NSF does for a variety of reasons, but um, this is largely using the NSF definitions. And not surprisingly, um, so we, we take jobs off of the um, current population survey, which gives us a lot of information about workers and the occupations they're in. And we take education fields from the American Community Survey, which in 2009 asked a special set of supplemental questions about what people's undergraduate fields of study were and their graduate fields of study for people with those degrees. And you, know, you get this sort of a list of um, occupations that you're looking at and then equivalent education and training. And um, you can go back and look at these reports in more detail if you want the full list of, of what are the things that we consider STEM occupations and jobs. 
Um, so let's start with the question of how are these jobs growing? There were 7.6 million STEM workers in the United States in 2010, which constituted about 5.5% of the U.S. workforce. Further, as this chart shows, STEM jobs have been growing rapidly. This, these, this graph is from 1994 to 2010. Um, the occupation codes changed before 94, so this is the period over which we have a consistent set of occupation coding. Between 2000 and 2010, employment in STEM jobs grew by 8%, while employment in non-STEM jobs grew by only 2.6%. The other thing you see on this slide, which is interesting, is the effect of the tech bubble um, in the early 2000s. And you can see the STEM jobs slow down. And then as the economy starts moving again, um, they, they shoot up quite rapidly. And even during the recession, do not fall, unlike many other occupations, which is you know, back to the comment that um, I will return to again, that um, STEM jobs are, um, have been quite good jobs over this last recession. Um, so if this is the aggregate number of jobs, who works in these jobs? Um, workers in STEM jobs have a variety of characteristics. Let's talk first about education. I don't think it's going to surprise anyone in this room to know that STEM workers on average have quite a bit more education than non-STEM workers. So the red um, uh, bars here are the distribution of, not, of all workers um, across these four education categories, high school diploma or less, some college or an associate degree, a four-year college degree and a graduate degree. And as you can see, you've got about a third of the workforce in those two lower skilled categories and then a declining share among the total workforce, the red bars in um, the higher education shares. If you look at STEM jobs, um, you see just the opposite. Um, the majority of STEM workers by far are, have either bachelor's degrees or graduate degrees. And so you have higher education people disproportionately represented in STEM jobs. However, I would note that about a quarter, 26% of STEM workers do have um, you know, some post high school degree but don't have a college degree. And just to give, I often get questions to sort of, you know, what, what are these non-college jobs that STEM workers are in? And just to read through the list of the um, top occupational categories where you see a substantial number of non-college degree STEM workers, engineering technicians, computer support specialists, computer scientists, network system analysts, computer programmers, computer and information system managers, and network and computer system administrators, many of which require some technical degrees, but not necessarily four-year college degrees. Um, if you move from education to gender, um, again, I suspect no one in this room is going to be surprised by the fact that there is a substantial gender gap among STEM workers. It's very large. Um, to the left, you see male workers, and to the right, you see the opposite of that, female workers. And again, red is all workers, blue is STEM workers. So 48% of all workers are female, 52% are male. However, only 24% of STEM workers are female, while 76% are male. So um, female workers are you know, only half as well represented in STEM fields as they are overall within the entire workforce. And this particularly emphasizes the need to encourage more women to enter STEM occupations and fields. And I'm, I'm sure that Q&A will come back to that. I'm sure the next panel is going to discuss that as well. You know, so what are all the reasons why women are underrepresented in these fields? Um, turning to the report that we are releasing this morning, I'm sort of taking you through highlights of a number of these different reports. As I said this morning, we're releasing a report on diversity inside STEM fields. So to show you some charts that are hot off the presses, um, this looks at um, STEM employment um, by race and ethnicity. And again, the, the red bars are all workers. The blue bars are STEM workers. As you can see, about 11% of the whole workforce is um, black, non-Hispanic, but less than half of that only 6% of STEM workers are, are um, black. Um, among Hispanics, 14% of the whole workforce is Hispanic, only 6% of STEM workers again. And Asian Americans are overrepresented in STEM fields. 14% of STEM workers are Asian American, only 5% here. So if you're looking at historically disadvantaged groups within the United States, you see here substantial underrepresentation in STEM as you see underrepresentation among women. And um, you know these differences, I should note, arise primarily from the share of each group that graduates from college. Blacks are 7.4% of workers with college degrees, but only 5.5% of workers with STEM degrees. 
Hispanics are 6.2% of workers with college degrees, but 5.9% of them have STEM degrees, which is to say that conditional on going to college, you see much greater participation in STEM fields. It's the fact that African American and Spanish, uh, Hispanic um, work, um, workers are much less likely to have the college or the graduate degrees that really leads them to be underrepresented in these STEM fields. That's not true of women. I should note, where women actually have higher degrees, uh, high, higher amounts of education than men do. So there's clearly some different stories going on here in terms of gender underrepresentation in STEM as opposed to um, black and Hispanic underrepresentation in STEM. Furthermore, in this new report, we also look at foreign-born workers. Foreign-born workers are more likely to be in STEM jobs than our native-born workers, just over half. The majority of these workers are naturalized U.S. citizens. So foreign-born but U.S. citizens make up the majority of STEM foreign-born workers. From 1994 to 2010, foreign-born workers accounted for approximately half of the rise of all STEM workers. So you're pulling a lot of foreign-born workers into the STEM workforce over the last 10, 15 years. Now, there may be a number of reasons as to why foreign-born are more likely to be in STEM, and I'm, I'm speculating here, but um, foreign-born students are more likely to come to the U.S. for degrees in STEM-related fields. People from MIT know this. And um, we know that a number of these students stay in the United States. Um, the majority of these do become naturalized U.S. citizens when they stay. Businesses may be more likely to hire foreign workers into STEM fields if they believe the U.S. talent pool is not deep enough for them. And we do know that a higher share of students in universities from other countries major in STEM-related fields. And of course, there's always the second generation effect. Children are really amazingly likely to follow their parents' occupations, even, even in the modern world. I'm always amazed how strong those correlations are. So if a number of persons born abroad came as children to the United States when their father or mother was hired here as a STEM worker or came here as a STEM student, these children may also be more likely to receive STEM degrees and to remain in STEM fields. Among all STEM workers, these foreign-born, native-born differences are not all that large. 20% of the STEM workforce is foreign-born, while only 16% of the overall workforce is foreign-born. So it's not that big a difference, 20% versus 16%. But the differences are very large among the more educated. So this slide shows you STEM workers and all workers with graduate degrees and STEM workers and all workers with bachelor's degrees. And the solid lines are the, um, the foreign-born and the dotted lines are, are all workers. Um, this is actually not well labeled when I look at this. The, what says STEM workers with the graduate should be foreign-born STEM workers, and STEM workers with a bachelor degree should be foreign-born um, STEM workers. So you can see that among those with a graduate degree in STEM, um, I'm sorry, yeah, over 35% uh, over of them, I misspoke, over 35% of all STEM workers with a graduate degree are foreign-born, whereas only about 16, 17% of all workers with a graduate degree or foreign born. So there's this very large gap at that very high level of education in terms of the share and representation of foreign born within STEM workers. There's much less of a gap among workers with bachelor's degrees. It's only three or four percentage points. Um, so that um, foreign, um, foreign born workers are really driving particularly the STEM workforce at that graduate degree level. So next question, are STEM jobs good jobs? And um, unemployment in STEM jobs rose last in the last four years than in other occupations, which suggests that these jobs have been more stable in an uncertain economy. We can also look at wages in STEM jobs. And one of the things that we do in these reports is we run wage regressions, controlling for all the usual variables, age, age education, et cetera, and look at whether there is a wage premium for STEM jobs. So the question here is controlling for all the usual things you'd want to control for to say, you know, what are people getting paid? Do people in STEM fields get paid more who, than equivalent workers in non-STEM fields? And um, this graph shows you the wage premium over time. Um, so that the, the dotted black line here, which is total, suggests that on average, STEM workers in 2010 had about a 25% wage premium, a little over that, 26%, um, in STEM jobs. So this is equivalent workers in terms of age, education, other background characteristics, were earning about 25% more in STEM fields than in other fields. And um, you know, there's a variety of reasons that we can come back and talk about, about why there might be a wage premium in STEM fields. What's really interesting here is the largest premium occurs among the least educated workers. So those with less than a bachelor's degree, those with all those associate degrees, are getting premiums that are in excess of 30%. Those who have bachelor's degrees get about a 23% premium. Those with graduate degrees get about a 12% premium. It is worth noting, though I don't show it for you in this slide, 
the wage premium for women in STEM jobs is larger than for men. Similarly, the wage premium for persons of color is larger than for white non-Hispanics. And the wage premium among the foreign born is larger than among the native born. So interestingly, some of those underrepresented groups, women, persons of historically disadvantaged groups, actually get larger wage premiums, leading to this interesting question of why are so few women or African Americans or Hispanics entering these fields? The greater wage premiums suggest they are in demand, so what barriers are there that are preventing their entry? And again, I know that's a question we'll come back to. So what are the issues that I think these reports raise about um, the STEM workforce? First of all, I think there's an emphasis here that STEM jobs are growing and are particularly important to some of our highest innovation industry sectors. It's going to be important for the U.S. to expand the pool of talent for these jobs in order to retain these industries here in the United States. The STEM workforce is key for the long-term competitiveness of U.S. manufacturing and U.S. non-manufacturing um, in a global economy. Secondly, STEM jobs are good jobs for workers at all educational levels. They should be attractive jobs. They should be, you know, people should be pulled into this sort of training and into this part of the workforce if they have the talents and the interests for it. Thirdly, there is a paradox that some of the workers who seem to benefit the most from STEM jobs are disproportionately not entering the training that would lead them to STEM employment. It is important to identify and break down the barriers that particularly prevent girls, African-American and Hispanic students from entering STEM training and STEM jobs. Finally, the U.S. has benefited greatly from its ability to pull foreign-born students with STEM training into the U.S. and into U.S. citizenship. And this flow of workers is clearly important and is likely to remain important through the near future. Let me end by talking about a few policies that um, this administration has particularly been promoting. The president has been, I say, very personally interested in STEM-related um, uh, jobs and in pulling people into STEM. It's, it's an issue that he raises both publicly and privately with some frequency. So let me note some of the things that are currently on the policy plate for the administration. The president's FY12 budget, currently in debate in Congress, proposes about 206 million in STEM training programs. This includes Department of Education dollars, developed teacher training in K-12 around STEM-related topics, as well as dollars to the National Science Foundation to launch research on effective teacher training in STEM. The Educate to Innovate campaign, which was launched in 2009, is designed to improve U.S. students' participation and performance in STEM fields particularly focused on women and underrepresented groups. In January 2010, as part of this effort, more than $250 million in public and private investments were added to help prepare over 10,000 new math and science teachers and train, retrain and train over 100,000 existing teachers. The Race to the Top Fund, which is $4.3 billion, provides competitive grants to states to encourage and reward states with high K-12 achievement and give them resources to continue and expand on what they're doing right. The grant awards provide special preferences to states with STEM-focused efforts. And then I should note, at the Department of Commerce and many, many other agencies, there are a large number of agency-specific STEM programs. To mention, too, that I'm particularly fond of at the Department of Commerce, NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, runs a Teacher at Sea summer program, which takes science teachers and puts them on NOAA boats that are doing um, hydrographical work <laughs> over the summer for a week at a time to actually experience hands-on research and to bring those experiences back to the classroom. NIST, the National Institute for Science and Technology, which is also within the Department of Commerce, runs a summer institute for middle school science teachers um, that's held at NIST and attracts teachers from across the country and which has actually grown over time and in interest and is very much focused in helping these teachers attract students who wouldn't normally think of themselves as being interested in science to come into science in the middle school area and develop their interests. So these sorts of programs are across government and it is partnerships between government and the private sector in particular on a whole variety of these programs that make them effective. So to conclude, we can and we must do better at preparing American students for the jobs of tomorrow. Among other things, this means a focus on STEM training. This is not something that happens just at college and graduate school, but almost surely needs to start at younger ages with strong math and science training in elementary school onward. Our competitiveness as a nation depends upon our success. 
America will have a difficult time competing for 21st century industries if our children lack the skills and the education that are integral to those industries in the future. Make no mistake, this is a national imperative and a national economic imperative. It's critical that we understand and treat it as one. That's why this administration is so strongly committed to doing its share to strengthening STEM training in the U.S. Ultimately, it's part of how we rebuild America's economic foundation stronger than it was before the recent financial crisis. But this is certainly not something that the federal government can possibly do by itself. We must work in partnership with local and state public education authorities, with private schools, with the private sector, um, and, you know, and industries and as well as private schools across the country, all of whom are going to be the ultimate beneficiary of an expanded number of qualified STEM workers. So um, if you want to know more about all of this, um, here's the reference. Go to www.esa.gov, the Economics and Statistics Administration at the Department of Commerce, and there'll be a button there for reports. And if you hit that, you will see um, the, these three reports, one of which released in July, one in August, and one released today. So you can get our latest report on diversity in STEM fields and um, do further reading and look at more numbers if that's um, what you happen to want to see. With that, I will stop and we'll turn to Q&A. Thank you. So uh, thank you for all that uh, information. We have a little bit of time for a Q&A. I just want to start with a, a quick question, and then we'll turn uh, to uh, the audience. I can tell uh, Dr. Blank had tremendous uh, training at Brookings by listing these three reports. Uh, you want additional information? You can go get it. A, a, a good Brookings uh, characteristic there, so we appreciate that. Uh, you were talking about the importance of STEM for jobs and economic prosperity. You've issued uh, reports along with uh, Mark on uh, gender, uh, race, and uh, ethnic uh, differences. Um, and, and in your talk, you mentioned there are different reasons for the underrepresentation. Could you just tell us a little bit about what you think the primary reasons are and how the policy solutions the administration is uh, following can help address those issues? So one of the things that I think is very clear is that there's no magic bullet here. There's not one single problem that if you could fix this, you would solve the underrepresentation of women and of historically um, underrepresented minorities in STEM fields. Um, the, the issues are multiple. You know, it has to do with um, the uh, examples that um, people have at home. So to the extent you're more likely to do what your parents did, you know, because women have historically not been in STEM fields. You know, very few girls see their mother working in these fields and don't follow them. And the same thing is true for black and Hispanic students. It has to do with where people are encouraged to go and how they're encouraged through their teachers and their guidance counselors in a school, what they're encouraged to be interested in. And for better or for worse, some groups are less encouraged towards science and math than others. You know, and you know, so there's a whole range of issues here, you know, cultural and institutional that affect you know, why people end up with the occupational choices that they do. And you know, that's what makes this hard to get at. It's why the administration proposals are aimed, you know, not just at, you know, col in fact, I think large numbers of colleges, universities are doing a very, very good job at trying to attract women and African Americans and blacks into STEM-related fields. There's some very creative things being done in a variety of engineering schools that I know about. Chuck, I know, can talk more about that. Um, but we're focusing a lot of dollars at the elementary and secondary level um, to train teachers and to improve science and math education because if you don't get them interested at a younger age, it's very rare that you're going to capture them in college. So, that's okay. Uh, we have a question right here. Yeah. If you can uh, give us your name and your organization, and we have a microphone uh, coming up as well. We'd also ask you if you can keep your questions brief just so we can get to as many people as possible. Thank you. I'm Paula Stern, and this morning I'm representing the National Center for <laughs> Women in Information Technology, which is an NSF-born uh, organization. And I would thank you so much mm -hmm. for these studies. They're fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, we 
completely support everything mm -hmm. you're doing there. My question is about unpacking STEM. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, uh, you had a list on your jobs, mm -hmm. which is the key ratio of the jobs to training, I think is critically important. But there's so many job openings there in various computer related, information technology related, and yet in our curriculum, particularly secondary and mm -hmm. then all the way down to K through 12, um, we don't teach computing qua computing. We don't have the mm -hmm. curriculum focused on that. Can you unpack some of these uh, numbers uh, mm -hmm. regarding STEM and what the recommendations the administration has with regard to focusing tactically mm -hmm. on where the jobs are in the computing area mm -hmm. versus some of these other areas? And also, as I understand, mm -hmm. women are highly represented in many of the biologies, et cetera, but mm -hmm. they're definitely terribly underrepresented in computing and computing-related sciences and information mm -hmm. technology. Yeah. So I think you've made the most important point, which is there are a wide variety of STEM fields, and the stories do differ a little bit by group, by, you know, there's some areas where women are more represented. For instance, biology is one of them. You know, there's certain areas where, um, you know, foreign-born um, students and workers are much more represented, and engineering is one of those areas, and they're a little less represented in some of the biological fields. So, so you know, depending on your level of interest, if you're interested at a more micro level um, of, sp of particular types of occupation, you can get some very different stories here. I should say the administration emphasis here, while you know, depending on what bureau you're talking about, you know, Department of Ener Energy focuses on energy things, NOAA focuses on more you know, biological, ocean-related things. Um, you know, there are different programs in the administration that focus on di different topics here. The, the focus in terms of a lot of the training dollars are, are not to try to say we're going to put our dollars in this particular occupation. or this. You know, it's rather to focus training broadly for teachers and for you know, the National Science Foundation to study um, what is it that makes more effective teaching that pulls people into these fields. And you know, some of those studies are going to relate to computer sciences and gender. Some of those studies are going to relate to you know, engineering and African American students. So you know, I, I think the funding is designed to spread a pretty broad net to look at the whole range of questions. OK, uh, right there. Hi, my name is Kamsi McAdams, and I'm the STEM director for DC Public Schools. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm curious, you mentioned a lot of this, like, you know, getting advice from the teachers and the counselors. And that seems like a lot of push up. And I'm really interested in reach down. Mm -hmm. So you talked about interesting programs at the university level. We have a fantastic relationship with MIT, so thank you very much. <laughs> We're going to come and do some professional development for our teachers. But I'm curious about um, motivating the trade schools and the associate degree granting institutions and these like places where they do you know, IT related and computer science related um, tech jobs because I think that's really a, um, appealing to the population of students that I serve, to the parents, because like you said, you know, a lot of these parents are not ready to send their kids off to a four-year institution, but they might be ready to send them to trade school. So I wonder if you know anything about creative programs where two-year degrees and trade schools are doing a reach down into the um, K-12 sector. Yeah, that's a great question. To be honest, I think that's a better question for the next panel than it probably is for me. Um, one thing the administration has been trying to do is put quite a bit of money into community colleges and you know, sort of the, the two-year and associate's degrees in part because there's large numbers of students for whom that is going to be the type of post-high school education they get, and we really need to provide good training and good opportunities for that group of students. And some of those dollars are focused on STEM. Some of those dollars are focused on just attracting and retaining students, um, you know, and not particularly STEM-focused, but STEM is it something that will benefit from that? Uh, right here is a question. Hi, Edie Fraser, STEM Connector and Diversified Search. Mm -hmm. First of all, thank you for all three reports. We all are using them, and we look forward to the new diversity one today. You know, we have been working on profiling 3,000 organizations committed to diversity, mm -hmm. STEM, and overall. We've taken 500 corporations, and what is really interesting for you is to really focus on the workforce planning side of what mm -hmm. the companies say their workforce needs are for STEM jobs and the career categories that you've referenced with the NSF categories and what the companies are saying with the matches coming out of the community college, colleges, and graduate school system 
and getting more of these companies mm -hmm. really to commit mm -hmm. to close that gap on the workforce mm -hmm. needs and the STEM availability mm -hmm. on supply yeah. and demand. Yeah. One of the things that um, I've been doing over the last couple of months is going out and holding roundtables with um, business leaders from a variety of different communities around the country. And um, one of the things I hear again and again is exactly the, the difficulties of hiring people with certain types of skills. And inevitably, we get into a series of conversations about how do you link the private sector up with um, the educational sector so that there's you know close communication there and series of and I think this is something that um, has not been very well developed in the past, but is being developed in many areas of the country at this point, and particularly with the community college system, so that you know the sorts of technicians and training programs that um, there are jobs to hire into are actually being developed inside um, in, inside these educational systems. But you know, it does take very good collaboration and cooperation and communication back and forth um, between groups that have historically not talked to each other as much as they should. In the very back, standing in the back. Good morning. My name is Tim Speck, and I'm an Einstein Fellow with the National Science Foundation. And you had mentioned the, the Teachers at Sea program that NOAA does, mm -hmm. and I've not participated, but mm -hmm. I've heard it's a fantastic mm -hmm. program from other teachers that I've worked with. Uh, in this last fiscal year, the proposed 2012 budget, it looks like uh, the Department of Energy is cutting the ACTS program, which uh, partners uh, teachers, K-12 teachers with scientists, and then the NSF is going to be terminating the GK-12 STEM Fellows program, which puts mm -hmm. about 1,000 graduate students uh, in, in places them in, <coughs> I'm sorry, in K-12 through classrooms with teachers and students. And, you know, those partnerships are obviously very important, and those are, they bring about significant role models both for teachers and students to increase participation in STEM uh, and to promote STEM uh, careers for students in, that are K through 12. So what are the uh, potential solutions? I know this administration mm -hmm. really seems like it is promoting STEM education, but then when we cut some of these programs, um, what's, what's the solution to kind of uh, get these programs mm -hmm. to rise above the static in a very difficult mm -hmm. budgetary uh, situation? Yeah. No, it's a great question, and obviously, um, you know, budget cuts have real effects, and you know, we're going to be seeing them in a variety of different fields. The, um, you know, the president has said again and again, and I actually think he's just, he's right on on this one that uh, at the same time that we have to control deficits, there are certain areas of priority and investment that, for our long-term economic stability and competitiveness, we have to make. And the three that he mentions all the time are education, infrastructure, and innovation. And STEM fields, of course, in some ways are at the center of those first two, innovation and education. So um, I know that this administration is quite committed to saying, even in the midst of difficult budget times, we're going to try as hard as we can to preserve some of the commitments that, have, you know, that we think are really long-term investments. And that may mean cutting other programs even more so that you can not only preserve, but in some cases even increase. Um, some of the education and innovation programs, which include some of these STEM programs. And the fact that these are in the budget and um, the administration is working on them, even in the midst of the deficit negotiations, I think is a statement of what a high priority this administration puts on them. You know, will there be some casualties? Uh, probably so, but I think there are going to be far few casualties in this area than in some other areas of the budget. There's a question in the back right there. I'm Julia Clark from the National Science Foundation. Mm -hmm. And I want to, to follow up on the very first question that I would ask you in terms of uh, mm -hmm. the underrepresented uh, mm -hmm. persons are in, in STEM. And you mentioned there are certain groups who might not be interested uh, uh, in science. Uh, I, my concern is in reference to equity and access. Uh, mm -hmm. We, uh, in terms of the uh, achievement gap, we know mm -hmm. that in schools where there are a high mm -hmm. number of minority students, uh, they have less prepared teachers, less mm -hmm. funding. So what is the role uh, of the federal government in making certain that mm -hmm. uh, equity and access is uh, mm -hmm. are available to, to everyone? Yeah. So that's exactly the reason to put additional training, additional dollars into teacher training. 
that, you know, I, I don't think there are groups that are inherently more or less interested in STEM fields. There are groups that don't have the same background or understanding of why this is, it's even interesting to think about various science fields, at, either for sources of study or for future, um, future jobs. So um, the dollars here are going into teacher training with um, a real focus on teacher training in schools where um, they can make a difference, particularly for these um, gaps. Um, focused on trying to bring more women in, trying to bring underrepresented groups um, into STEM, and um, you know, I, you know, we'll see how this works. It's a program that's really just, you know, the proposal is in the 2012 budget, um, you know, so the dollars need to be appropriated, and we we've got to see how it plays out. But but at a center of the program is a concern about the gaps that I was talking about. We have a question over here on the aisle. Yeah, there's a microphone coming over to you right there. Mm -hmm. I'm Wanda Gill, U.S. Department of Education. I'm curious about the data. I was wondering if you included those companies who have gone to foreign countries for tax and other breaks and possibly hiring more STEM workers in those locations, just as we've got coming here people from Ireland and Egypt and different places who are STEM scientists working at a number of our uh, public, in our, a number of our public um, jobs. For, for instance, at Fort Detrick, there's a whole colony of people from various countries. So I was just curious to know that because it might influence the findings if they were in other countries and hiring natives to those countries in American firms. Yeah. Thank you. So our data is jobs in the United States. It's all persons employed in the U.S., whether they are U.S. citizens or not. Um, so what you're looking at here is a picture of, of, of work in the U.S. proper. Um, the fact that a company might be hiring people someplace else is not included in this data. All right, thank you. Yeah. My name is Bonnie Bracey Sutton. I work with the Power of Us Foundation, mm -hmm. and I'm a teacher. I've been bounced around for 30 years mm -hmm. as a STEM teacher mm -hmm. when people didn't want. How can we recapture those people who've been in teaching, mm -hmm. who love science, who've taken all of those courses, and who are now out of it because they were not given permission to teach? Um, I will note that um, one part of the um, jobs proposal that the president laid out on Thursday night is a proposal to provide funding to states to rehire teachers who have been laid off, as well as first responders. And I think part of the real concern that you know I and I know others in the administration have about where we are right now in the economy is the impact, particularly on education. With the you know, if you look at what's happening to employment at the state and local level, a very high share of jobs that are being shed are teaching jobs. And um, you know, that's something the federal government, at least in the short term, can do something about if we pass the president's jobs package. Uh, John, there's a question right next to you, right on the aisle. I actually have two quick questions. One is a follow-up with regard to the cutting of programs. Is the administration and the different departments going to consider really using um, IT, especially broadband? If you have um, fellows and um, grad students coming into the classroom, to be cost-effective, maybe doing it um, by way of broadbanding so it teaches the kids. The reality is a lot of us do webinars because we can't be at many places at one time. Mm -hmm. And then having that reinforced by that teacher in the classroom, that's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, with regard to the underserved, particularly those that are in the jails, transitioning back, does the administration or, or any of the departments, Department of, and I don't know, Justice, doing programs that's going to be brought into the, 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 the um, judicial system to start the educational process by way of technology, broadband, um, webinars, that kind of thing, to help integrate those that are coming back into society. So, um, you know, specific curriculums that schools use are, you know, largely not the purview of the federal government. This really is a decision that often happens at the state and local level. And I do know that, particularly within rural areas, a number of um, states and localities are making greater use of distance learning and. And certainly a large number of colleges are making use of that. One of the things that we do to support that is to expand broadband um, and um, high-speed internet access throughout the country. So um, in the Department of Commerce, um, we've had basically put more than $4 billion in grants out there to underserved communities, both urban as well as rural, to build out high-speed internet networks so that um, this is all part of the um, stimulus funding from 2009 so that we're building out almost 40,000 miles of additional broadband networks. And the whole idea here is to provide not just you know, businesses, schools, local communities, families, um, much greater access to broadband in areas where they historically haven't had them. To the extent to which schools use them, that, that becomes much more of the local school curriculum issue. 
I simply can't answer your question about what's happening with regard to um, incarcerated and their retraining. I, you know, that's something that's a little outside of my lane. Okay, uh, we have time for just a couple more questions, and we're going to move to our next panel. Uh, right there on the aisle. Mm -hmm. This is just really quick, and I'm with Department of Ed, and just wanted to know, for any of your premium data, where you talked about the wage premiums, mm -hmm. did any of that include, um, like, for instance, somebody in a STEM job, quote unquote STEM job, did that include those in the content, the content-based teachers? Somebody who may have a mathematics degree, but to say is certified to teach secondary math. Are wage premium um, data capturing people in those? Areas. I don't know if that's considered a STEM job, if you're considered a STEM math teacher, is that considered a, or is a STEM job more of the theoretical mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. STEM people, like an engineer per yeah. se, or? A yeah, STEM jobs actually do not include people who teach in STEM fields. They, they are jobs out there in the community. The, the problem here is that actually in the National Science Foundation definition, those are included as STEM jobs, but in our data, we do not have information on what teachers actually teach. So we couldn't separate a math teacher from an English teacher. So we did not include teachers, therefore, in our, because we just couldn't do it in the data that we had available to us. So this is um, jobs out in the private sector, not, not in the teaching profession. There's also, I guess, a quote unquote, a lot of what I would say maybe a hidden STEM job, like maybe mm -hmm. like say an actuary. Mm -hmm. They may have a mathematics degree, they may be doing mm -hmm. pure math all day, linear models. Mm -hmm. and forecasting and future analysis, something mm -hmm. an engineer may be doing, but he or she may be more mm -hmm. of a business type job and not really a STEM yeah. title. It's quite possible, and there are a good number of people no. with STEM degrees who do not work in STEM related fields, and some of them could be like this, which you call a hidden STEM job. I, you know, we simply can't identify that in our data. We're limited yeah. to what we have. And also, can yeah. you Um, just go to www.esa.gov and click the button on reports, and you will get this. You'll, you'll get this list and all the other reports that the Economics and Statistics Administration has done. We have a question right over here. Good morning, David Kramer, uh, mm -hmm. Department of State, Office of Overseas mm -hmm. Schools. Um, I just over the years as a former elementary principal and. Uh, head of school in a number of places, uh, I made some observations. We talk about the foundation of education uh, is, in my opinion, is really at the primary level. And, and the fact of the matter is, and you talked mm -hmm. about this, is that women are under, under um, they're, not, they're not involved in uh, the science and math and technology. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not represented as much as males are, but at the elementary level in education, they're they predominate there. So mm -hmm. I, I'd just be interested to know what the discussion's been, you know, mm -hmm. what you know about mm -hmm. that. How do we attack that? You know, how do we get, how do we get women interested mm -hmm. in promoting math and science at the elementary level mm -hmm. so we can get kids ex excited about it there so that it carries mm -hmm. on? Because yeah. if we can't get it going there, we're not, we're not gonna yeah. get it going anywhere. You know, I, I agree with you, and that's exactly one of the reasons why the teacher training dollars are focused very heavily on the K-12 to areas to try to increase, you know, sort of training and you know, to, to teach well in terms of science and math, which may not be the field that teachers, you know, specialized in when they were in college. Um, it's, it, I, it's a fascinating question. I mean, my own impression, I, I'm probably get in trouble by saying this, my own impression is that um, math curriculums have actually in, really have improved dramatically and become much more uh, user-friendly in some ways. I know when my daughter went through school, she just did a number of really interesting exercises that were very different from what I did when I was learning math in elementary school. I think science curriculums still have a ways to go, and the opportunities there are enormous, but we do not do, bring, do a good job of bringing science curriculums into the elementary school ages for, in many, many classrooms. Uh, we have time for one more question right there in the aisle near the back. My name is Latasha Plavnik. I'm with the Consortium of Social Science Association. Mm -hmm. My question is, in this area, we, um, Northrop Grumman, Unisys, SAIC, those are very computer, compu um, software engineering mm -hmm. heavy organizations that do a lot of work with Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Defense. And I was wondering if you know of any programs that those organizations um, that work so closely with such important organizations in the government, if they're working together to make programs to develop, maybe to help 
high school students, college students enter into STEM fields or doing anything to train teachers in STEM fields or anything like that? So I don't know anything about those specific companies. What I do know is that quite a large consortium of private sector companies have joined with the government in this educate to innovate effort, which is a public-private partnership in which there is dollars from the public and the private sectors to support teacher training and to, and to both bring new teachers into science and math as well as to train and retrain 100,000 existing teachers. So there's very, there is at this point a lot of strong interest on the part of the private sector in being involved in these efforts. And you're really seeing the fruits of that, I think, coming through with some of the programs that are in place. Okay, uh, we are out of time for this portion of the uh, segment. We're going to be uh, bringing our other uh, panelists up, so uh, please uh, stick around. But I want to thank uh, Dr. Rebecca Blank for sharing her insights and all these terrific reports that you put out. <laughs>